When most people think of Sarawak food, I think the first thing that comes to mind is Laksa Sarawak. But we've already shown you how to make a vegan version of Laksa Sarawak in Street Food Journey Series 1 with vegan chef Dave. So this time we're going to focus on another famous Sarawak dish called Golomi, which is a noodles that's often served with mincemeat and char siu. I'll show you how to make a vegan version of that. In Sarawak, there's a popular local bagel called Gompia. It's naturally vegan, but I'll show you the quickest, easiest way to make gompia and also give you a suggestion on how to serve it as well. MOMC at Hearts, Elias Mora will demonstrate how to make vegan roti chanai and also a quick and easy way to make the dip that goes with it. And finally, Marco D will take us on some of his destination highlights from his past trip to Sarawak what in my mind is Malaysia's most exotic state. Okay, so we're going to make a vegan version of Sarawak Kolomi. Sarawak Kolomi is like Sarawak's version of Kon Lo Mien, but with some differences, it uses a more springy egg noodle typically and also it's usually served with minced pork and with char stew or barbecue meat and of course we're going to make all this vegan okay so uh, first of all we're going to use uh, some mushrooms to make the minced meat with and also the char stew okay and I'm using king oyster mushrooms we're going to uh, braise this in a hoisin base uh, sauce to turn it into char stew okay turning the heat on Throw in the mushroom stems. I'm gonna add some light soy sauce, and thick soy sauce, hoisin sauce. It's gonna add a little bit of five spice powder, optional. Give it an extra flavor burst. I'm gonna add some fermented tofu, again optional. If you have red food coloring, add some red food coloring so it looks like how char siu you looks. Add a fair bit of sugar. So while that's cooking, we're going to use the mushroom tops and just cut it into small little bits. And we're going to mix it up with some tofu, like some uh, tofu puffs okay the tofu puffs will give it that springy texture that we want and we're going to use a combination of these two as the mincemeat replacement but of course any kind of mincemeat replacement you want to use you're welcome to do that as well So this is done, we'll set it aside and let it cool down a bit before we cut it up. Okay, so now we're going to make the minced meat, okay? Heating this pan up and we're going to use some minced onion and minced garlic for this. This is oil that's been used to fry some onions previously for crispy fried slots that we're going to use in this dish. So it's very aromatic. Okay, in goes the garlic, a fair bit of garlic, and some crushed onion. So it's starting to get aromatic. I'm going to add in the mushroom and tofu puff bits. We're going to add lots of white pepper to this. If you have sarawak pepper, perfect, okay? If not, just whatever pepper you can get. Mushroom seasoning. A bit of rice wine, but this is optional. Some thick soya sauce or cooking caramel. A dash of soya sauce. Thin soya sauce. That's it. Take it off the heat. So let's cut up the vegan char siu. Okay, 
So we've got some separately blanched wheat noodles. These are vegan noodles, so they don't have any egg in them. And you want the ones that are springy, okay? And just prepare according to manufacturer's instructions. And got some blanched gailan Chinese greens. So we're just going to assemble this. some of the char siu sauce over it. If you can get a hold of some pickled green chilies, you can add those. Some homemade fried shallots and some green onion. Okay. So there you go. It's your vegan iteration of a popular Sarawak noodle dish, Golomi. Give it a shot. Alright, we've arrived at the Sarawak Cultural Village. This is where you learn everything there is to know about the Sarawak culture. This place is huge. The Cultural Village was opened in 1989. So it was a 17 and a half acre whereby you can see the seven major ethnic houses in Sarawak. So we do have the Bidayu, Iban, Melanau, Penan, Orok Ulu, Malay and also Chinese farmhouse. So this major uh, ethnic was the biggest in Borneo. So. They have so many different types of houses. And you know what? It's so interesting to actually experience it all here. It's pretty cool seeing all these things that some traditional Sarawakians used to build. There's plenty more to see. This is the roundhouse known as Barok. Barok, which is also known as a meeting hall for people. So it can be the shape, it can be round or triangle or rectangular, which is depends on which area they came from the Bidayu people. So this is also the uh, Bidayu head house, but this one is a different shape. The one over there is round. So the Bidayu, they specialize in bamboo and everything which is with the bamboo. Like the one over here, the pulau which is covered with a split bamboo. So normally this, they call it kelebu, not only for decoration for the Orang Ulu people, but they believe this, when they hang this thing, it can drive away evil spirits. Well, I tell you what, I've had such a good time here. I did not realise there are so many different types of ethnic groups here in Sarawak and all the different religions and history. It's been so good. Thanks so much, Benjamin. Thank you very much for coming and I hope to see you again for the next rainforest. I will be there in a heartbeat. Thank okay, you so see much, see you again. See you later, yeah. Hey guys, I'm Nils Murat here from Masters of Malaysian Cuisine and today I'm going to bring you one of the, my personal favourite dishes in the whole world. Honestly, it's no joke. Um, it's going to be roti chanai, which is a Malaysian bread, crispy, fluffy fried bread uh, with a lentil curry. So let's get started. I've got here 250 grams of plain flour or type 450 and 250 grams of uh, bread flour, which is type 550. Um, we're going to have some oil and we've got 200 milliliters of water and uh, a pinch of sugar to subsidize also the sweetness which a condensed milk would usually bring um, and salt so really simple we're gonna add everything into our bowl just knead it just like every every other dough that's like actually that's not much difference the biggest difference is uh, probably the oil so this is it, and you know, bring it out and just knead it until nice and firm. For now it doesn't have to be the most pretty one, 
because we are going to have it um, rest for about half an hour because now everything has to be like, pulled together. So just place it back in the bowl, put the towel on top, and now in half an hour I'll come back. Now I'm back after half an hour and uh, we're going to look at our dough. Um, now we're going to uh, just um, divide it into our portions. I've got half the dough so I'm making four and just divide them into even pieces. You just fold them, make balls. Like you can just put it here, put your hands on top, and then press it against the, uh, the table and make them to nice, nice balls here. Yeah? So you pull, fold, pull, fold, you do that all the way around. And then you make circles while keeping it in line. I'm going to take another ball, place them in the bowl, and then we coat them with quite a lot of oil. It's quite a lot, and they need to be like swimming in it. Make sure it's not too close and it's always covered with oil. And that's no worries. We're going to use the oil later for frying, and you can reuse it. It's not, it's not, you don't need to waste it. Or just rest it for three, four hours before actually using it. For lentil curry, you've of course got lentils. There's two ways you could do this. You could also soak these overnight, or just I usually cook it, and uh, it usually takes half an hour. Then you strain it, and then you can just add it to your curry. A little bit of salt. For the rest of the curry, we're gonna make it really simple. There are different a thousand ways of doing. If you've got a mixer, it's really fast because you just actually blend. Everything in the mixer, chunks, one onion, four cloves of garlic, and uh, roughly, these are like two thumbs sizes ginger peel. And um, now you can also use fresh tomatoes, so you just add this one in there. So that's it. Probably, then. yes. We've got a nice, like this is like a curry paste, whatever you feel like using. We've got a lot of different spices. So I'll just show you how I add it. I add turmeric. some cumin, just a cinnamon, and the mustard seeds. So I'm just gonna, I, I have got chili powder, which makes it easier. Just add a bit. Okay, now you see it's starting to dry. And I'm just gonna add, start adding the oil. Mix it. You want to have it slightly caramelized. And now you want to let it cook for a bit, reduce the heat. And now you want actually the oil and the curry to separate a bit. Got some salt. Now I've got some uh, lemon. Uh, you could be using uh, lime or, or um, like usually you would, be, you would be using tamarind. You can just get a tamarind paste. So you add a little bit of sugar. Lentils are done. Yeah, you see them, you can you taste them if they are uh, soft, nice and soft. You just take them out, strain them, and you add everything back into your curry. And curry is done. Okay. So our dough has now rested for about four hours and uh, we're going to have a look at it. So it's a bit greasy, that's okay, that's good. Um, we're going to spread a little bit of oil on our surface and we're going to gently press this out, flatten it. So okay, so first you like put one hand on top, one on the bottom and you start flipping. Stretch a bit more. So it's not. Make a circle and you press it down so you make a lot of layers. Those are roti 
Rotis and now we we'll just put them in the pan and fry them until they are nice and flaky. We heat the pan to medium heat, add a little oil. And now you basically fry it as if it were a normal pancake anywhere. And you want it a bit of brown, you don't want it to be black and dry. Just after you have uh, finished frying, you take the roti, put it in the middle. Now you always turn smash to uh, make it nice and fluffy. And that's your roti chanai. So now we take our plate, add our lentil curry, coriander, and then our very nice roti and we have it, roti chanai. This is your roti chanai. Seriously, try it. It's one of the best dishes in the world. Um, I mean, I went to Malaysia, into the restaurant for two months. This is what I did every day. Because it's just one of my absolute favorites. Eat it with your hand or spoon or fork. This is how we eat it. After the Sarawak Cultural Village, we head out to get some of that famous Sarawak layer cake that I really wanted to try. Yum! Look at all that colour and flavour. How are you? I'm good, okay. So are you going to teach me how to make some layer cake today? Okay. Oh, I would love to make it. It looks really nice and tasty. So should we get started? Okay. So we made the layer cake and you know what, it was quite a simple process. I mean, straight away we had the layers, we put them together, we put the jam in it like glue, stuck it together and then we got the end layer on top and it looks like this. This is, I'm very happy with this, are you happy with this? Yeah. I think we did a good job. Thank you so much, thank you so much for your help and I'll see, I'll come back next year and I'll get some more layer cake. There are lots of different recipes out there for gompia, which is like a really rustic bagel that you can serve with a number of different things. Uh, this one I came across is the easiest one available and I've tweaked it a little bit, but it's courtesy of Wai Shu Shu's blog. Have a look. So we've got some flour over here. Usually you'll use bread flour. I don't have any bread flour on hand. So what I'm using is plain flour plus a bit of gluten added to it. And you want a bit of sugar, some instant yeast, a little bit of salt, some lukewarm water. And now we're just going to knead this in a dough mixer or you can knead it by hand as well. This has been kneading for about five or six minutes and what we want to do now is add a bit of oil to this and knead it some more. There you go. So what we want to do now is take this out and stick in the bowl and let it proof till it doubles in size. So let's cover this and we're going to leave this alone till it doubles in size and we'll come back. Okay, so this is what this looks like now. It's doubled in the bowl. We're going to take this out. We're going to roll it. We're going to dip it in some sesame seeds, we're going to make a hole in it, we're going to let it rest and then we're going to bake it. I'm going to punch it down. It gets 
some sesame seeds out. What you want to do is flatten these into rounds and coat one side with sesame seeds and then just make sure that the sesame seeds are pressed into the surface. Just going to poke a hole in the middle of these. Then we're going to let it rest for 15 minutes or so. Then we're going to bake it in the oven for about 15 minutes at 180 degrees Celsius and it's done, okay? I'll come back and show you what it looks like. So there you go, straight out of the oven, still very hot. Um, they are meant to be quite flat and quite uh, biscuity and they're great to eat right away. If you store them overnight, you might find that they need to be uh, reheated otherwise they get quite dry and quite uh, uh, yeah quite crunchy okay so there you go Gompia. and this is great to eat with just uh, bread and jam or you can use the mincemeat that we did for the kolomi but make it sweeter okay let me just show you how it looks like so let's cut up one of these it's going to be a little bit tricky to manage because they're straight out of the oven so they're hot but in the meantime this is the kolomi filling the vegan filling that i fried up but i actually add more sugar to this just cut it open and stuff it in the middle. Okay, so don't forget, if you want the recipes to all our vegan episodes, you need to sign up, malaysianchefs.com slash streetfoodjourneys, and we'll send it out to you. I'll see you later. The center is located 24 kilometers from Kaching. These orangutans, you can only find them in Borneo and Sumatra in Indonesia. Always oh, gonna do something. And what's really cool is in places like England and Europe, you can see these in the zoos, but you can't get this close, you know. It's like I'm living in the wildlife with this orangutan. It's such a great experience. This orangutan center trains orphaned or rescued orangutans to survive in the wild. Well, before, I said, you know, it's quite cool being close to these orangutans, but now I'm happy this one is quite far away because look at the size of it. It's so big. I think just one grasp of his hand. Over 20 orangutans live in the forest within the nature reserve and often return to the centre at feeding times. So as we speak, there's three more coming through. They're like swinging from trees to trees and they're all coming up. So I think they've all seen the food, which is pretty awesome. But this big, this big orangutan here, I don't think you can let anyone take his food. 